Hi, so this is Generating Your Assumptions, a talk about testing. So let's quickly go over why we want to test our code. First, we want code confidence. We want to sleep soundly at night and not have to worry about our code breaking. We also want to prevent regressions. We want to move forwards, not backwards. We also want to spend time working on the fun stuff, the features, and not just fixing bugs all the time. It can also help improve the design of our code. And of course, we want happier users. So let's take a look at an example on how we traditionally write tests. Say we want to parse an integer string into an integer value. We set up the test, and we pick a random example. Let's just say 0. Put that in a string, and then we run our parse int function, and we assert that it should be the integer value 0. But we also want to test a two-digit two -digit number. So let's just say 10. Do the same thing. And we notice that they both end in a 0. So let's switch it up a bit, and let's try out 15. Do the same thing. And just to be extra safe, let's try a three-digit number. Let's try 100. Well, we ended up having a bug in our code because we forgot about negative numbers. So let's throw in a negative number. And there was over 2 billion possible integers that we could have picked from in that case. Here's a great quote by Dijkstra saying, program testing can only be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. So we can only truly be confident in our code for the exact test scenarios that we test for. The rest are just assumptions. We assume that our test works for other similar scenarios. We assume that we wrote enough tests. We also assume that people reading our test know our assumptions that we made. And if we really think about our programs, there's a lot of different scenarios. You've got all these different inputs. We just looked at integers, for example. Um, you've got all these different code paths. You've got all these different order of operations. And you have different time between operations. So how do we follow Dijkstra's advice and then get more test coverage? Well, we could just start writing more test scenarios. But let's be realistic. We don't want to do that. It's repetitive. It's also error prone. Honestly, it's boring. And it still requires us to think. We still have to think about the edge cases for our system. Here's a really great quote by Rich Hickey, the creator of Clojure, saying, I don't think that people should write a lot of tests. I think people should run a lot of tests. Now, that might sound crazy. I'm up here talking about testing, talking about how great it is, and then showing you a quote saying people shouldn't write a lot of tests. Well, what he's getting at here is that people just aren't very good at writing test scenarios. But computers are really good at this. They can think of millions of scenarios and generate those. They can also keep all those scenarios organized for us. So let's go back to our part parse int string example. What we really want here is to say for all integers in string form, they can be parsed to their integer value. So what if we had the computer just generate integers for us? We could take that integer, put it in a string form, and then assert that it should be the integer value. And the computer can do this a ton of times. And that's really what property-based testing is all about. You generate test case scenarios to help verify a property of our system. So what do I mean by property? A property is under given circumstances, something that is always true. So let's take a look at a few examples. Sorting should always maintain the same size. Concatenating two strings should contain both strings. Argument order does not matter when adding two numbers. So what are some benefits of thinking at the property level instead of very specific, concrete examples? Well, one thing is that it's really expressive. You're documenting in your test what you're truly trying to test for. And they're also more general and less prone to change. Higher level properties don't change as much as very specific, concrete examples. Another benefit is that it can help you find edge cases. So maybe it generates some empty collections, or maybe a string with some special characters that you didn't think of. It might generate min and max integers. And say you're generating dates, it might generate some dates with leap years. And an obvious one is that it can create many different test cases. You can generate millions of scenarios that we would just never write. And every time you run that test again, it might try to generate them with a different seed 
which will generate new uh, scenarios, so you're continuously trying to break your assumptions. It also makes you think, will this always be true in my system? You have to know your code, and you have to know about the requirements. So to get started, you need a framework. And it all started with Haskell's Quick Check. But nowadays, there's a framework in a bunch of different languages. So there's one for Java, C Sharp, Scala, Kotlin, and many more. The following examples will be in Kotlin using Kotlin test. So to get started, you need a generator. This is what generates test data. And all these frameworks come with basic generators for basic types. So say we have the int generator. It might generate a zero. It might generate a random number, let's say 98. And it might generate more of an edge case, negative one. So then you've got the string generator. It might generate empty strings. It might generate a normal string, ABC. And it might generate a more complicated string. The great thing about generators is that they're composable. So say we have a product. It requires a name of a string and a price, which is an int. Well, you could use the bind function to combine the string generator and the positive integers generator to randomly generate a name and a price. With those, you can create your product. So now you have a generator that knows how to create a product. And say you need to create a list of products. You can wrap that with gen.list, and now it knows how to create a list of your product. This is also useful for stubbing. So say you have some example-based test and you just want random data. You could use generators to just give you that random data. So you might be thinking, OK, if generators generate all this complicated data, doesn't that make it harder to debug? And it definitely does, but there's this great thing called shrinking. And shrinking is a process of reducing and simplifying generated data upon a test failure. So say we're generating a product and it fails. It will try to, try to run the same steps again, but with simpler input. And then if it fails again, it will try to uh, simplify the input some more. So it really tries to narrow down the root cause. OK, so say we're sold on property-based testing and we want to try this out. We'll probably start with a small, simple example. In this case, we'll find the most recent valid order. We set up our test, and then we set up an orders generator to generate a random list of orders. And we get the result from our function, most recent valid order, using the orders that are provided. And then we hit a roadblock. This is random data, and we don't know what to assert against. And this is a common hurdle. We just don't know what to assert against because the input's random. And the function is so simple that it's hard to find a property. So you kind of end up trying to use the function that you're testing to generate an assertion value, and that's just not good. But luckily, there's some patterns to help you get started. You really need to change your mindset when you're doing property-based testing. So the first pattern is modeling. You can test against an alternative implementation. The implementation should be reliably correct, and the implementation could be a slower, more naive version. It could also be a legacy version. So say you're refactoring something, you could test against that legacy version to make sure that your new version is at least as correct as the old version. So let's go back to our most recent valid order example. Uh, we use our orders generator to generate a list of orders. We get our result again. And then to assert against it, we use the standard functions that we know and trust in Kotlin. So we'll filter out all orders, just get the successful ones. And then we'll sort by the date. And then we'll use first or null to grab the first value or return null. And then we could assert against that expected value. Another pattern is a generalization pattern. And you start by writing down a few example scenarios first, and then you take a look at those and see if you can come up with a more abstract property. So let's use a simple example, getting the last product ID. So we have a function, get last added product ID, and then we provide it some data. We'll give it a list of one, a list of three, and a list of two. Well, when we look at this, we could see that it's always just the last number that we give it. So we can make a property for this. 
We need an ID generator, so we'll just use a standard positive integers one. And we need a list of IDs, so we'll wrap that in gen.list. And now we're given a randomly generated list of product IDs and a very specific ID. So we could take that very specific ID and add it to the end of our randomly generated product IDs and then run that with our function. So then we know that we could always assert on that very specific ID. Another pattern is the invariance pattern. So like a lot of problems in computer science, things are easier when you break them down into smaller problems. And that's what we're doing with the invariance pattern. We're breaking this test down into smaller properties. Strong ropes are built from smaller threads put together. So when you have a bunch of smaller properties, you can end up with a pretty robust test suite. So let's take a look at this function, the checkout total. It requires a list of products and an optional discount. It returns an int to represent the total. So now we could think of a sub-property. One might be the total should always be at least zero. We should never have a negative total in our checkout system. So we use a product generator and a discount code generator to generate a list of products and a discount. We run our calculate total with the products and the discount, and then we assert that it should always be at least greater than or equal to zero. Another sub-property might be that zero items should always have a total of zero. So this time we only need a discount. So we use a discount code generator to generate a discount. And we'll run calculate total, but giving it an empty list for the products. And then we assert that the total should always be zero in this case. One more example could be a valid discount code should always reduce the total. So here we'll generate a non-empty list of products and a valid discount. We'll run calculate total, giving it the products, but we'll give it null for the discount. Then we'll run it again, giving it the same products and a valid discount. Then we could assert that the total with the discount should be less than the total without the discount. One more pattern is a symmetry pattern. And this is useful when you have a reversible sequence of actions. So basically, when you apply the opposite actions together, you'll get the original. So let's take a look at JSON parsing. We want to verify that serialized orders should always be deserialized to the original. So we'll use our orders generator, generate a random list of orders. And we'll deserialize our serialized orders. And then we'll assert that they should be the original. Now this works in a lot of cases, except for one. If your deserialize and serialize functions just don't do anything at all, then this would pass. So we need either another test or another assertion to verify that it's at least doing something. So in this example, we'll just add in uh, an assertion into our test to verify that the serialized version is in fact JSON now. And then we'll do the same thing. We'll deserialize our serialized version and then verify that it's the original. So all the examples so far have been on small stateless functions. So you might be wondering, can we use property-based testing at a higher level on a really stateful system? And you can, and it's actually really good at that. So you could take the same patterns we looked at and apply those to a stateful system, but you could also do one more pretty cool trick, which I'll show you now. But it first starts with data. So generators generate data, and data is data. It can represent whatever we want it to. So it can represent more than just inputs to our functions. It can represent represent actions to place on our system. So say we have a stateful system. It has a few methods. Do something, update with an integer value, and get the state. We could represent these methods as data. So we could create a class, do this, a class with update, also taking in an integer value, and a class get state. If you're familiar with Elm or Redux, you're already doing this, so you get this for free. And then we could create a generator to generate a list of those actions that we could apply to our system. So for example, it might generate do this, update with a value of five, and get the state. It might generate a list where you do two updates. And it might generate a list where you don't do any updates at all. There's tons of different possibilities here. 
So let's look at a more realistic example. Say we have a simple database, a key value store system. So we have save, which requires a key and a value, remove, which requires a key, get, which needs a key, get all, clear, and size. If we take a step back and think about our key value system at a higher level, it's not so much different than the responsibilities of a hash map, which is also a key value system. It has put, which requires a key and a value, remove, which needs a key, get, which needs a key, values, clear, and size. So we could use a hash map as a model for our more complicated key value store system. So they have the same operations. The hash map's just a simpler version, and we trust that a hash map works. So let's create our actions to represent our methods in our database. We have save, which needs a key and a value. Remove and get both need a key, clear, and size. We need to make a generator to generate these actions. So we'll make an action generator, and that requires a key generator and a value generator, and it returns an action. So we need to pick which action to return, and you could use this nice function one of, which given a list of generators, it will pick one of those generated items. First, we need to create our save action. So we can use bind to bind a key and a value, then we can construct our save action. Remove and get only need a key, so we could use map to just change the type. And now we're returning uh, actions for remove and get. Get all, clear, and size don't require anything and will always be the same data for every like, time it's generated. So we'll just use create. Excuse yeah. What is the generator for key? Uh, it's whatever you pass in. So you're going to pass that into the function. So it's more generic. I mean, let's say it's an integer. Yep. Can you specify? Yeah, exactly. So we're actually going to show that in the next slide. So, um, oh, well, it's pretty soon. Um, so this might generate uh, an order saying to save, might clear the database, and then attempt to get that order, remove that order, et cetera. Again, a lot of possibilities. So now we have data to represent the methods. We need to actually invoke those methods. So we'll create a runner. And this takes in a model, which is our map, and an action. And we use pattern matching to just run the appropriate method based on the action that we're given. So say we're given a save action. We'll run model.put with the action's key and the value. We'll do the same thing for our database. This function takes in a database and an action. And we'll pattern match on the action and then invoke the corresponding method. So say we get action clear, we'll run db clear. Now let's take a look at our test. We want to verify that saving orders in our key value database works. So we need to create a generator for generating keys. And we want to in encourage collisions, so we'll just choose a random number between 0 and 50. Then we need to generate our list of actions. So we'll use gen.list and give it our action generator. So we want to verify that after all these actions are ran, the, our database will have the same values as that map. So given a random list of actions, we create a, a model, and we create our database. And then for every action, we go and run those actions on both the model and the database. And then at the end, we assert that they both contain the same values. OK, so say we found a bug in our code. What would happen if we didn't have any tests to, to figure this out? Well, an unhappy user could find it. They could leave a bad review saying, doesn't work, one star, zero if I could. So you might reach out to that user. You might check analytics or go dig around in crash reports. This is a worst case scenario. We want to avoid this. What if a traditional example-based test caught this? Well, you'd get a failing assertion saying what failed but you still have to go debug and figure out why that failed. Now what would happen if our property-based test found this? Well, you'd get the same assertion saying what failed, 
but you can see the steps to take to reproduce this issue. So you end up with the perfect bug report, and it's chunking down into the least data required to replicate this issue. So in this case, you need to run save with this data, you need to run remove with this data, and save again. So we know the exact methods to run in the exact order with the simplest inputs possible to replicate this issue. So you might be thinking, OK, why would I ever write an example-based test again if I could just have a computer generate millions of scenarios for me? Well, example-based tests and property-based tests really complement each other. So example-based tests are good for known edge cases. Say you have a known code path, you want to make that explicit and make sure that it always gets ran. Um, they're also faster to run. Property-based tests are pretty fast, but if you're generating thousands or millions of scenarios, that's going to take longer than just a few examples. And not everything can be expressed as a property. So in those cases, you just have to drop down to example-based testing. And they're easier to write. Property-based tests require more thought. So now let's take a look at some real-world example success stories. Let's take a look at Clojure. It's a fantastic functional Lisp for the JVM. Using property-based testing, a bug in core Clojure was found when converting between immutable and mutable data structures. This was fixed in Clojure 1.6. Clojure also has this nice library called spec, which provides a specification system for your functions, and that provides out-of-the-box support for property-based testing. Let's take a look at LevelDB, a key value database from Google. A bug was found using the model pattern within just a few minutes. This bug required 17 steps to reproduce. And of those 17 steps, it involved things like opening and closing the database, adding and deleting the same key. These are just things that we would have never thought to test for. Let's take a look at JS YAML, a, po a popular YAML parsing JavaScript library. It is over 1 million downloads per day, and a bug was found using the symmetry pattern in just around 10 lines of code. It basically said for any YAML that you output, you should be able to read back in. If you're curious and want to learn more, there's a fantastic property-based testing book at propertesting.com. John Hughes was one of the original creators of QuickCheck, and he has a lot of really good talks on YouTube. And Spotify wrote a blog post about generating test cases so you don't have to. Thanks.